Welcome to Conversations on Care, our Facebook talk show bringing together service providers, clients, caregivers to help families better understand and cope with aging parents with chronic care needs. My name is Julie Collada, and I'm the founder and president of Open Arms Solutions, a senior care agency serving the Chicagoland area, specializing in inspired holistic dementia care. It's our mission to help you through the journey and to know that your loved one is living their best life possible. If you find these dialogues helpful, please do give us a like and a share so that we can reach out to more people who can really benefit from this kind of information. If you have questions or topics that you'd like to learn more about, we welcome hearing about that. And uh, please put that information in the comments section and we'll, make, and we'll do our best to put a program together for you. With me today is Jessica Barch. Um, I am thrilled to have Beth, Jessica with us today. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit your bio, Jessica, so everyone knows who you are and the important work that you do. Uh, Jessica is a community program manager for the Parkinson's Foundation. She received her Master's of Science in Community Counseling from the National Lewis University in Chicago, earning a National Certification Certified Counselor credential from the National Board of Certified Counselors, and holds a Foundation in Aging and Disability Certificate from the Boston University School of Social Work after her father's diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, uh, her passion and career merged. Jessica is inspired every day by her family, the Parkinson's uh, disease community, and really the hope for a cure. So, so happy to have you here. Yeah, thank Jessica, you. Jessica, we've gotten to know each other over the kind of the last year. We've never met, and this is the yes. first time I think we've sat and seen each other. At least it's virtually we're, we're seeing each other. We've exactly. talked a fair amount on the phone. And um, as Jessica knows, o Open Arms has, has been working on and very excited about a uh, specialized Parkinson's program. So Jessica has ha been able to guide me in different directions to help us build a very special program. And in part, because of her guidance, um, we found uh, the Park, Park Nicolette Struthers Parkinson Center, which is a center of excellence um, uh, from the Parkinson's uh, Foundation. And we found, and incredibly grateful that we found the Struthers Care Network, which is part of that group, which is really dedicated to training organizations uh, to help and really healthcare organizations like ours get very, better training and support to better support Parkinson's uh, patients and their families. So very proud of the fact that we are now part of that Struthers Foundation. Um, so Jessica, tell me, you, you told us in, in your bio, it says you a little bit about your inspiration yeah. behind what you do, but just, just, Tell us a little bit more about how you ended up at the Parkinson's Foundation. What was your inspiration? Yeah, um, so again, thank you for that warm welcome. And I'm so happy to be here and, and actually see you <laughs> all yes. in person, hopefully one day in person. But yes, um, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, as you mentioned in my bio, so my dad lived with Parkinson's for about 13 years. And um, he really was my inspiration. Um, when I first was in school, grad school for counseling, originally I just wanted to work with older adults because I really have always loved, um, kind of gravitated toward them. But with my dad's diagnosis, it kind of evolved. And um, you know, then I wanted to work with the Parkinson community. So, um, and the way that I kind of got connected with the foundation was, I mean, essentially in a moment of crisis, we. I reached out to the Parkinson Foundation helpline. I have to give a plug for those ladies because they're wonderful. Yeah. Um, you know, I reached out there to them because I just had, we had a question. Like I said, we were kind of in a moment of crisis with my dad's Parkinson's and I can't really even remember specifically what it was, but, but that connected me with the foundation. And then I just kind of said, Hey, how could I get involved in a local level? 
So um, my I started volunteering with them through um, the Moving Day Committee. Moving Day is our annual fundraiser, and um, it happens in Chicago every year. And so um, I just started getting involved in the Moving Day Committee, and then eventually it led me to um, my position now, which is Community Program Manager. Wonderful. You know, it's, you know, I, uh, many people on my team have heard me say this, but it's an incredible gift when you can merge, as you said, something that's so personally connected to you and you're passionate about with your career. Yeah. So I, I so appreciate that. Um, so tell us a little bit more about the work that the Parkinson's Foundation does. Yeah, um, you know, so essentially the foundation is this organization that supports the Parkinson community. Um, and we try to do everything we can to really make the lives better of anyone affected by this disease, whether you are the person living with Parkinson's or whether you're a caregiver or, you know, someone just who loves someone with Parkinson's. We're really here to support you. And, um, and we're guided by, we call our three pillars. So our three pillars are um, um, focusing on research so we can develop you know, better therapies for people living with Parkinson's disease. Um, also, we want to provide um, educational resources. Um, that's so huge and that's what I do, um, provide all these great educational resources for the community. And um, we have like wonderful books and we have our aware and care kit. Um, we also have our educational programs. Um, and we also want to ensure better care for people with Parkinson's by creating a network of care. Um, and you were mentioning a uh, center of excellence. So essentially what a center of excellence is, we have about 47 um, designated centers of excellence. Majority of them are in the US. Um, we do have some um, in other countries, but really what that is, is a healthcare system or a hospital that has proven to give um, you know, really good care to someone with Parkinson's. Yeah, absolutely. And here in Chicago, I believe Rush University. Um, Rush Medical Center. And then Medical Center, thank you. Yeah, Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Yeah. So yeah. here in Chicago, we have two centers of excellence. So we have two. Important, important for people to know. Um, all right, terrific. Um, so. Uh, you know, throughout the years, we've had open arms. We're, we're in our 14th year now, which is amazing. And over those 14 years, we've cared for many, many people with Parkinson's disease. Yeah. And it just, it feels to me like those statistics are growing just like Alzheimer's disease. But what, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the statistics behind the disease? Definitely. And and they actually are growing just because of the aging population. You know, they expect well, it to increase um, exponentially. Yeah. So. Um, just some of the you know basic statistics. So right now it's estimated that there's 1 million people living with Parkinson's disease in the U.S. and about 10 million worldwide. It's also estimated that every year there's about 60,000 people in the U.S. who are diagnosed with Parkinson's. It is the most um, common, it's the second most common um, neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's. Um, more men than women get it, but of course we know, um, you know, many women do get a diagnosis of Parkinson's. The average age, age of diagnosis is typically around 60, although we know that there is um, something called young onset Parkinson's and that is under 50 years old. You yes. receive the diagnosis at that point. Yeah. Yes. So it is, um, it's, it's very probable that, and you and I were talking about this before we went on the program, that someone we know, someone you know, a neighbor, a friend, has someone in their family that's affected by this disease. So. Yes. So, this is a, a really, you know, an important question, and it's like anything. Once, once someone has a diagnosis of Parkinson's, or your family member has a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, what's next? What are what in your from your experience? Uh, what are the next steps? What should people do and think about? Well, I think it's really important as with any chronic progressive disease like Parkinson's is to ask the question, okay, what now? How do I live my best life with this disease, right? Um, I know that when my dad was diagnosed, it took about a year for him to receive a diagnosis. And, um, and that's actually pretty typical because, you know, you kind of get shuffled around between doctors and, um, but eventually when he did receive the diagnosis for them, it was kind of a relief 
Um, not that they wanted a diagnosis of Parkinson's because we know that many people see, see that as, you know, kind of devastating news. But I think at that point they were, they at least knew what they were dealing with and they, you know, had, okay, how do we tackle this beast, right? So what do we do next? Um, and I'm going to highlight our newly diagnosed initiative when I'm talking about this because I think it's super important. Um, and this, before I show you this, because I have, I just want to show it up, show it for a moment if you don't mind. But um, well, you know, we we received a lot of feedback from the community. Um, many people have told us that when they received a diagnosis of Parkinson's, maybe it was from a general neurologist or maybe even like their, you know, general um, provider, you know. Um, they were given a prescription for carbidopa levodopa, which is, if you don't know, if anyone watching this doesn't know, that is the main medication um, for Parkinson's disease that many people get. And they were given that and they were kind of put on their way. So sent on their way. And we know that for us to know about Parkinson's, we know that there's so much more to it. So that's why this was created. So I'll just kind of hold it up for you. It's a really simple little packet. So it's a newly diagnosed, it's a folder. Um, and in the folder, we have like a letter from someone who lives with Parkinson's. We have um, an overview about Parkinson's disease. We have key questions to ask your doctor, which I think is one of the most important things in here um, because a lot of times people don't know really what to ask their doctor, right? Especially in regards to Parkinson's. And then we have this little brochure that I'm just gonna highlight really quickly. So it's five steps to living um, your best life with Parkinson's. And I won't go too deeply into these, but I'll just kind of touch on them. So one step we say is think about what is most important to you because you want to try to, you know, keep living the life that you are living and do all the things that you love. So make an action plan so you can keep doing that. Um, number two, find someone to talk to. This is really, really important. So <clears throat> many people with Parkinson's tend to become isolated for a variety of reasons. Um, one big reason is that they don't like the way they look physically. Um, so if they're exhibiting a symptom like stooped over posture, or maybe their walking is, um, you know, kind of smaller steps, like they refer to that as more of like a shuffling step. Um, a lot of people feel uncomfortable with the way they look, so they tend to, you know, kind of stay home and not really hang out and be as social as they used to. So we say find someone to talk to because we really want to reduce isolation, um, whether it's a support group um, or um, someone in your family, just someone, just an ear, right? And and I want to note that some people. I'm really uncomfortable with going to support groups, um, especially a support group that let's say, you might see someone sitting across from you. That's an example of what you may become, right? We can only imagine people who don't have a Parkinson's diagnosis, who don't live with the disease, how hard that would be. Um, but we also point out that it does affect people very differently. So that doesn't necessarily mean that will be you, but we can understand why someone says, I'm not ready for that. So I always say, you know what, find an exercise class that you love because exercise is so important for Parkinson's. Find a Parkinson's specific exercise class. You will find so much camaraderie in your in this class. This is I hear this all the time. These become your people, right? Because they know what you're dealing with. They're, they're experiencing a lot of the same symptoms. Um, and essentially that becomes like your support group, right? So yeah. really important to find you know, find some support, reduce isolation, you know, still stay active. Um, number three is create healthy habits. Um, we say try to, you know, really try to get good sleep, um, eat well, try to eat healthy. And they have suggestions for better diets for people with Parkinson's like Mediterranean diet. Um, so it's really good to kind of lay that groundwork at, at the whole picture to live a letter, better life with Parkinson's. Number four, one of the most important things, what I just mentioned, um, be active in whatever way you can. So um, we recommend, um, and I could share this with you after and something maybe we can post after, Julie, but we have this great infographic about recommendations for exercise. So um, we recommend about two and a half hours a week for some of the Parkinson's um, of good aerobic exercise. So really get your heart rate up. Um, they say a good way to determine that is if you can't sing a song during that exercise, like you're, you know, you're working your heart, so you can't really sing a, you know, a song that you typically could while you're exercising at that level. But be active in whatever way works best for you. Um, maybe your baseline right now is sitting on the couch, right? You can always improve that. So set goals, walk around your living room, you know, walk around some rooms in your house, maybe work up to 
walking out down, you know, to your sidewalk in the front of your house, going back in, eventually walking around the block. Do whatever works best for you, but really, really incorporate exercise into your um, into your life at this point. And then number five, five, find a doctor who is an expert in Parkinson's. Um, this was a huge mistake that my family and I made, and hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? But um, if you have an expert, so an expert is something like um, a movement disorder specialist, which people refer to as an MDS. Um, that is a neurologist with additional training in Parkinson's um, and, and movement disorders, essentially. And um, Parkinson's falls under this umbrella of the term movement disorders because it's a disorder that affects your movement, right? And so we always say, try to find an expert. And especially in this area, we're really lucky in Chicagoland here. We have a lot of movement disorder specialists. We have a lot of experts in Parkinson's, a lot of support for this community. And we didn't even know this, having a dad who lived it for years Eventually, he ended up seeing a movement disorder specialist that was essentially in his backyard. My parents lived in West Chicago, um, Winfield, Illinois, um, Central DuPage Hospital, great movement disorder center. Of course, um, Rush downtown, like we said, um, Northwestern. But of course, it was easier for my parents to get to Winfield. So my dad had a, found a great doctor there. But we wish we had that doctor from the start. So if you're able to locate a specialist, or even if you don't have a movement disorder specialist near you, because it is kind of a niche um, you know, grouping of doctors, unfortunately, look for a neurologist whose interest is in Parkinson's disease. And if you're, if you need help finding that, you can always go to our parkinson.org website and search um, for a specialist near you um, with your zip code. Sarah, can you put that up in the comments, the parkinson's.org yeah. website? That would be great if you could do that. Thank you, Sarah. Sarah's our mission control. So, <laughs> Thank you very much that the initiatives, um, you know, make so much sense. And I'm sure they're so helpful for someone and, and yeah. family members too, you know, exactly. to, to follow that or have a guide that they can help their loved one follow when yeah. they have that diagnosis. So that's terrific. Um, let's look at some questions here. Ah, someone said, I've read that boxing has been found beneficial for individuals with Parkinson's. Is that true? And if so, can you talk about that? Why, what, what are those benefits? Yeah, that's, um, that's actually very true. So there's, um, if some, there's a very popular program right now called Rock Study Boxing, RSB. And um, it was started by someone who is living with Parkinson's and he um, started working with the trainer and his, the story goes is that, you know, once he was really into the boxing, one of his uh, symptoms is tremors. Um, so he would be boxing and really working out, really working up a sweat. And um, the name came from this because at one point he put his hand out and it wasn't tremoring anymore. And he said, look, rock steady. Like he, he lost his tremor, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, there's been a lot, there's been studies on it. And um, it's really just another wonderful example of how exercise really helps with reducing symptoms. Um, you know, and we believe that, you know, in, in the animal models, I think it has shown to um, slow, like show that it slows progression. But, um, and anecdotally, a lot of people do believe that they are keeping their Parkinson's. It's not stopping, you know, your Parkinson's, of course, but they live a lot better um, and control symptoms when they're really um, exercising a lot. So, but yes, boxing is very, very beneficial for people with Parkinson's. Yeah. Yep. That's a great question, whoever asked that. So thank you for asking that. Um, what, you know, what are some symptoms of dementia specific to Parkinson's? So that's a whole different challenge uh, on the topic, right? The yeah. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how well I can answer this. I can answer it from a personal, you know, standpoint. Yeah. My dad actually developed dementia from his Parkinson's. So there is basically like a Parkinson's induced dementia, right? Um, um, so people with dementia may experience um, some hallucinations. They're typically visual. Um, you know, you hear some, some hallucinations that are auditory, like ones that people hear and it can happen, but typically it's visual. Um, so there's, you know, the hallucinations that might come with the, with dementia from Parkinson's. I don't know how different it looks from other type of dementias, to be honest with you. 
Um, and that is um, that could be a great question if, so, if the person asking this wants to find out more. Um, that could be a great question for our helpline. I can give you our helpline number too, Sarah, if you want to put that in the chat, if you're, um, if you can do that. So our helpline number is 1-800-473-4636. Again, 1-800-473-4636. Um, or it's 1-800, the, the number 4-P-D-I-N-F-O. So 4-P-D-N-F-O. But, um, if that person wants to kind of go a little bit deeper into that, because I'm not a doctor, but um, but I don't know how different it looks specifically for Parkinson's. As well, well I, you know, the only thing I in we in the training that I've received from Struthers and other training, you know, dementia. There's not one kind of dementia. Dementia is a um, kind of an umbrella term for a lot of different yes. kinds of um, cog cognitive uh, deficits. Um, the in Parkinson's, from, from what I've learned, is that it tends to mirror more like a Lewy body, uh, that category of dementia. Not always. Yeah. That's where the um, sometimes people do have some um, delusion, delusional kinds of symptoms. Um, yes, and delusions are a part of it. Yes, and false, and that, and false beliefs. Right. Right. Exactly right. Um. All right. Well, thank you. Question. I think we covered. Oh, there was. Let's see. Ah, one question. Another question here. Lots of questions. It's terrific. What is the most important criteria to look for when hiring a caregiver for a client with Parkinson's? I don't know if that's something that you can speak to, but please. I could speak a little bit to it. And then I think you can, too, because this is what you guys do. Right. And right. Going through this training. Absolutely. So completed that training. Um, so. I really think um, you have to find someone that gels with your loved one and your family. It might take a while. I just had to put that out there. It might take a while to find a good fit for you and your family. We did. Um, you know, um, it took us a, it took us a few going through a few caregivers to find the one that was uh, good for our dad. Um, and she wasn't. I don't know how uh, how much she knew about Parkinson's um, before my dad, but she learned very quickly um, and. You know, she was a real bright girl and she's actually, and my dad passed away two and a half years ago, but we're still in contact with her. That often happens when there's yeah. a... She's come to like a family vacation before, you know, like she's wonderful yeah. and she really kind of became a part of our family. But I think it's really important to find someone that works well with your loved one. Um, if you can work with an organization like Open Arms, who's taking efforts into educating their staff about Parkinson's disease, that's really huge. Um because you want your, you know, it's really important for your loved one to get that medication um, on time and for the person who's caring for them to understand what Parkinson's is, right? So I'll let you speak a little bit to it, Julie, because, you know. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, you know, the, one of the reasons that it was important to me for us to join the Struthers hmm. is, uh, Parkinson's Care Network is they were really dedicated in the training curriculum and, and uh, so through so they provide wonderful training and for our caregivers and our staff. And, you know, people with Parkinson's, I mean, there's some just important fundamental things um, to understand about individuals with Parkinson's because like, just like dementia, you know, no two people are the same. Their symptoms aren't the same and how they need to be tra treated aren't their individuals. But there's some fundamental things about the disease that are important for caregivers to truly understand. And uh, the, the, Str the Struthers Care Network has this wonderful acronym called TULIPS, the TULIPS program. And a lot of all the training, it revolves around this TULIPS program. And the TULIPS is really, the T is time, just to understand that people with Parkinson's can't be rushed. Yes. And, and, and if you, if you, if you, in fact, it can be very detrimental to rush someone with Parkinson's. So caregivers need to understand that um, just and truly understanding um, the symptoms of the disease. Um, you know, there's just a lot of ambulatory challenges, tremors and changes in their gait. Um, and people as the disease advances, are a big fall risk. So caregivers and caregiving companies really need to understand 
how someone with Parkinson's progresses and what kind of support they're going to need. Mm -hmm. You know, part of the disease is that, as I've learned and as, as I'm learning about it, and I'm sure you know all too well, Jessica, people go through these on and off periods. Yes. And the, with that, you know, what we've learned in our training, and you need to make sure you have a care team that understands that in the off, in the off periods, people get frozen. They just, they can't move the way you and I move. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so there are certain things you can do, and there's a lot of cueing you can do for people to help them, um, be able to move during those periods. And then probably even more importantly is for people who take care of people with Parkinson's to understand how important pills on time are. Mm -hmm. And as you said before, because when you give the medication, the carbidopa, levodopa, and the other medications associated with that, um, it prevents the freezing or it minimizes the freezing and the off periods which is really essential to maintaining someone's quality of life. So you just need a care team that really understands that. Um, uh, not only the caregivers, but an organization that understands that. So, And, and I just, just cause I think this is a perfect time to kind of show this as well, because this super, one of our resources as well, it's called our aware and care kit. Right. So um, basically it has everything you need and here to communicate with the healthcare team let's say if your loved one's in the hospital with Parkinson's, about getting their medication on time, about drugs that are not safe um, right. for people with Parkinson's, because there are drugs, like there, there's some medications, um, like um, let's say pain killer medications that actually block dopamine. And dopamine is the, um, you know, the neurotransmitter that is depleted in a brain of someone with Parkinson's, so you don't want to make that worse. And right. it, really, it causes more of that freezing and, um, and more issues. So that's our wear and care kit. So I just kind of wanted to, um, it's a great way to advocate for your. That's, um, that's so important. Um, uh, we're, 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 I'm looking at the clock right now and we're almost out of time. Um, there, so I want to make sure that we, um, we get to some other things that are so important. Um, let's just talk about what are some ways caregivers can support their loved ones with Parkinson's? Yeah, um, I'll try to go through this quickly. So, of course, we can go a little bit over because this is important okay. information for people. So don't worry about that. OK, great. Thanks. Um, so, you know, the caregiver's role is obviously based on what the needs of the loved one. Right. So um, a lot of times we at the foundation we refer to a caregiver as a care partner because really they're working as a team. You know, let's say just give me an example of my mom and dad. So. Um, you know, my dad had Parkinson's, my mom was his care partner. And a lot of times they'd be working together. My, uh, you know, like my kind of definition is um, kind of changes of care partner because I believe that at some point then maybe you're maybe not as much as a partnering team, but, you know, maybe the caregiver is taking over more just based on the loved one's needs. Right. But I think a great way for the caregiver to support the loved one with Parkinson's, especially with the new diagnosis is really to validate their feelings and you know listen, be a great listener, especially in those early times when someone's trying to grasp all this. Because I can only imagine how how that would feel and um, what a, how you know just how overwhelming it would be, right? So validate their feelings, um, and I think something that's really helpful for someone is to go to all of their doctor's appointments with them. Mm -hmm. Um, be their extra set of ears. Mm -hmm. My mom had a notebook that she used specifically just for my dad's doctor appointments. So she would take notes. It was a great way to reference and go back to all the conversations that you've had at the doctor's office. They, they go back quickly and you're having, you know, these visits every three to four months. There's no way anyone can keep track of all that stuff without writing it down. So be an extra set of ears. Um, if your loved one is having a difficult time communicating, maybe based on the progression of their disease, be their voice for them. Um, and and really, if you can also prepare for these doctor's appointments, like I always say, before every appointment, write down any symptoms that may be appearing or symptoms that are not being, um, you know, really working, they're not being managed well by the medications. Write all down, write down your concerns, your questions prior to that appointment. Um, you do it collaboratively with your loved one. Um, and then you can actually go into that appointment 
feeling confident that you are conveying what your loved one's concerns are, you know, um, if they're not really able to communicate really well once they're in that appointment. So you can be their voice, but, you know, be their support system. Um, but also you have to take care of yourself. I'm going to kind of segue into that, Julie. Um, it's really important for a caregiver to take time for themselves. And um, I'm, I'm stealing this term from um, Pam Palmentero. He used to be a Western, but she always referred to a patchwork quilt of care of uh, support, right? And so she kind of was saying with that, like, pull the support where you can get it, right? A lot of times support is offered. Maybe it's through a friend, maybe it's through a, a children if you have them or a child. Um, and sometimes people are proud and maybe they just don't want to take it. But if someone is offering that support to you, accept it. It's okay, you know, and um, and let let you know, let them kind of sit with your loved one so you can get the respite that you need, whether it's just running errands, you know, grocery shopping, whether it's going to, you know, just do something really nice for yourself, take advantage of that and um, and really um, you know, take take care of yourself too, because you need to take care of yourself. And you also want to take better care of your loved one. And if you're depleted, that's not going to help anyone, right? Yeah. So take care of yourself. And something else that my mom had um, mentioned before that I kind of had conveyed with the with some people is that she always said that you have to forgive yourself because there are going to be moments where you are going to lose your mm. temper and your composure with your loved one. Mm. Um, with my dad, like I said, he had dementia. So sometimes there could be repeating of things or, um, or maybe, you know, kind of a theme with my dad was that, and it's actually pretty common with Parkinson's if someone has dementia and a false belief would be that their spouse or partner is being unfaithful. So that was a very common theme and um, toward, you know, with my mom and dad and my mom would become frustrated because she's like, I would never. Um, and then the joke is, was I never would even have the energy anyway, you know, and we had to kind of laugh about it. Right. Like you right. Have to a little bit too, but, um, right. but she said, you have to forgive yourself because you're going to be frustrated. This is not what you planned on. Right. Um, no one plans for this in their life. So forgive yourself and, and, accept that you are going to have feelings of guilt and feelings of anger and that it's completely normal. That's so important and really important words of advice. So we're, we're going to have to skip to just the last couple of questions yeah. here thoughts because uh, all you know, we could spend hours on this and hopefully would you be, if you'd be willing to come back, we'd love to have you back. Cause I think that uh, I, I suspect we're going to get a lot of feedback that this has helped a lot of people. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you. Um, so I think the, the, the most important thing that, well, not most important, I'm sorry, two things. So talk a little bit about the importance of assembling a care team. You talked about the importance of selecting your the physician, the neurologist, the yeah. experts, but, there, but there's more to it than that. So can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, definitely. So we always recommend that someone with Parkinson's um, has a care team and a care team is essentially um, comprised of your movement disorder specialist or, you know, Parkinson doctor. Um, we recommend that you engage with an occupational therapist, a physical therapist, um, a speech and language pathologist, um, a social worker or a counselor, right, to kind of address all these um, challenges that you might have. And and the thing is that you can be proactive. So we get this question a lot, like, when should I start doing physical therapy? When should I start seeing a speech and language pathologist? Um, be proactive and talk to your doctor about it because, um, you know, sometimes you have to get referrals for these, right? But um, if you're proactive and you can start those, you can start that, that stuff now even, you know? Um, and it's just really, and there's there's also a lot of great programs that kind of surround these um, disciplines as well. So like for instance, speech and language pathology. Um, there's a really, two really popular groups or two pro top, two popular programs, mm -hmm. OSVT mm -hmm. and Cloud. So it's, it stands for Lee Silverman Voice Training. Um, and BIG has to do with movement. So they have classes that really focus on doing big movements because a lot of people park with Parkinson's tend to have smaller um, movements, so smaller steps, smaller handwriting, quieter voice, right? So um, so they really focus on the big movements and the LSVT Loud focuses on projection of voice, working on all of this, keeping this strong, right? Because it also helps 
maintain your strong swallowing, eating of food, louder voice, right? So, right. so LSVT, big and loud. There's also the Parkinson's Voice Project, which is wonderful as well. Um, and I know Parkinson's Voice Project, um, and I believe LSVT too has an online presence, but Parkinson's Voice Project has like a Facebook group and they do live voice um, exercises on wow. a weekly basis. Um, and um, they're really wonderful too. So that all focuses on the voice, right? Um, um, and then PT uh, and OT are more common, you know, but just ask your doctor if you can become, you know, if you can get a referral, a referral for this and really start working with these um, groups to kind of maintain your strength and um, ultimately your independence for as long as you can. Great. Thank you for that. And then finally, tell us about Moving Day in Chicago, in, in Chicago what it's about, how people can participate if they'd like to. Yeah, um, Moving Day is great. Yeah, quick plug. Thank you so much for that. Um, so sure. we have our Moving Day Chicago coming up on Sunday, October 24th at 9 a.m. Um, traditionally, we used to have it in Lincoln Park, but um, the past uh, couple of years, we are in the south lot of Soldier Field. And essentially what Moving Day is, it's um, it's a walk. It is our fundraiser, right? We have Moving Days all over the states. But it's a way you create a team and you um, raise funds that go into um, community resources. They keep um, a lot of our resources free. Um, they go into our program. So it really supports all of our efforts in educating the community and providing resources for the community. So um, you kind of you know have a team raise some funds, do a walk. We have a movement pavilion. So we, cause really, we really highlight movement, right? It's so important and exercise. So we have a movement pavilion where people lead everyone in this group exercise. It's a really inspiring and hopeful event. And we're going to be able to be together this year. Um, you know, uh, that's the plan. So I guess I won't say 100%, so not good one. Yeah. Um, but but if you go to movingdaychicago.org, you can sign up a team. You do not have to raise money to attend it. Some walks, like you have to raise like a certain amount of money. Um, we don't require that. But um, it is really a really great uh, walk that really helps raise funds, like I said, and awareness of Parkinson's, which is so important. We are out of time. Yeah. It has been a pleasure talking with you. Same. Thank you so much for carving out time and being on our program. Oh, it's my pleasure, too. Thank you, Jen. And uh, I look forward to collaborating with you in the future to help people with Parkinson's. So thank yeah. you so much. Definitely. Have a great July 4th. Thank you. You as well. Thank you.